Okay, it's the end of the session. I'm here without Kiki, Sable, and Murdoch because they're inside. Um, uh, and in the video above, I was calling uh, Sable Aurora for some reason, but uh, her name is actually Sable. So Sable's a three-legged uh, husky. So basically, this is their roadmap to success. Now, primarily, we work with Kiki, uh, Kiki who took our puppy classes and has some uh, resource guarding issues that we addressed in the uh, video above. Uh, the only thing that I forgot and I left out of that one, uh, well, two things really. You can exercise Kiki before we do the exercise to make sure she has at least 10 minutes to recover. So there's some doggy stair masters or something like that. Also, when you get close enough, when the other dog gets close enough, get yourself a like a wooden spoon with a long handle and some wet food. Go to like uh, Wolf and Whiskers and get some uh, nice canned food. So when Kiki's eating, you're gradually going to collapse that distance. When you get pretty close, um, then you're going to take that long handle spoon with a little thing and plop that in her food, and then you would walk away with Aurora. Just kidding, with Sable. Um, okay, so um, uh, let me see. We started off by talking about exercise and we went over the doggy Stairmaster. Remember, I want you to talk to your vet about the dog Stairmaster because for puppies, repetitive activities can actually be damaging. Their bones are still soft and bendable, their joints also developing, and we don't want to cause any problems. Uh, but Aurora, uh, not Aurora, uh, Kiki is, I think, dramatically under-exercised. Your average dog needs at least an hour's worth of exercise a day. Um, although she gets to run, rough around with the, uh, run around with the dogs, uh, the walk that she got was late in the day and it was not a super long walk. So I uh, we went over some exercise. Now, remember uh, creative forms of exercise. Remember, it has to be done with an empty stomach at least 90 minutes after eating before the dogs do these things. Um, also, uh, you want to make sure the dogs have at least 10 or more minutes to recover after the activity ends before the next thing occurs. Otherwise, you can not really set the dog up to fail. So uh, the first thing that we did was the doggy Stairmaster. It's one I showed you on the stairs, so you throw in the treats. Message me if you forgot how to do that. First time to do it, all these exercises, max the dog out. Do it until the dog won't do it anymore. When it's a safe, it's got an empty stomach, maybe first thing in the morning. So you know what that dog's maximum number is. We want to find that Goldilocks amount. Remember that you might have different amounts of exercise that might set your dog up for uh, different activities. So maybe before a walk, maybe Kiki needs 15 up-downs on the stairs. Maybe before a guest comes over, she needs 25. Maybe before we do the resource guarding exercise, she needs 10. And so whatever it is, so play around with those elements until you find out the right combination that sets the dog up for success. Now, um, uh, I would like to see the doggy Stairmaster or you know, these exercises done every couple hours. Rora probably needs a short burst of exercise every about two to four hours. So the idea is play around with the, uh, the uh, intervals between until you find out what the right one is, where you really the, like, wow, the behavior was perfect that day. Now we know the right combination of exercise to get the dogs. Now these dogs are kenneled. Um, really only Kiki needs to be kenneled. The other two dogs do not need to be kenneled. And if a dog's in a kennel for longer than four hours, it starts uh, releasing cortisol, the stress hormone in their blood. And I saw a little twitchiness uh, for, uh, uh, for a couple of the dogs. Uh, and so at different times. And it could be related to the, uh, uh, to the kennel, but also the kennels, if a dog is in a kennel for too long, it can actually uh, uh, concentrate their energy. And for Kiki, I think it's an issue. Now Kiki also has problems being alone, so that's kind of why they kennel the dog so they're with, they're, with, they're with her. What I'd prefer to do is we start doing this in stages. So we put Kiki in her kennel, the other two kennels let's break down and get rid of them, and the other dogs don't need it, and then they put one of the dogs in there to hang out with Kiki uh, and for an hour. And the door to the room is closed, so the two dogs are in there, so Kiki feels comfortable having the presence of the other dog. The other dog that's not in there is not cooped up in a kennel and can relax and do its own thing. Then maybe later on in the day, we reverse it, put another dog in there with Kiki, and then Kiki's in the kennel and the other dog is free as well. Um, remember to exercise before, uh, like Zoom calls uh, or things along those lines. Remember to also be proactive when it comes to exercise. Don't wait for your dog to need it and then do it. You're doing it too late uh, in the wrong order. We'd rather exercise the dog uh, before before it needs it, and that way the dog is more comfortable. So if you see uh, Kiki trying to uh, take something from one of the other dogs or chew on his tail or whatever those things are, digging holes, don't think she's being a bad dog. Think, oh, she needs some exercise. Immediately take her to the stairs and do the doggy Stairmaster. Not necessarily immediately, give yourself a little bit of time. If the dog digs and you take them to the doggy Stairmaster and they like it, that could be a reward for the digging. So if they're digging, call them over, ask for a sit, walk towards the door, ask for another sit. Then once you get inside, ask for another sit. So do two or three things, then go inside and do the doggy Stairmaster. Um, I would have your daughter help you because that uh, she's old enough and she's coordinated enough she could do that. And that way you can get uh, her involved and that will help her engage with the dog a little bit better. Um, also, we talked about a sniffing on walks. Remember, don't give yourself a circuit, just give yourself a duration. I'm going to walk this direction for whatever number of minutes. When I reach the halfway point, I cross the street and we turn around and come back. We have fresh sifts on the way back. I'd like to see the two older dogs getting at least one walk a day. Doesn't have to be a marathon walk, maybe three to five minutes this way, 
and three to five minutes back. I would love to see a lot more, but I would love to see a, that you make a commitment to every single day, both those dogs get a minimum of a six minute walk. Um, I promise you as they get older, they're gonna start losing muscle and the stimulation keeps their brain alert and, and they'll live longer and they'll be happier if they will. Remember, sniffing also uh, is more energy burning than walking, so let the dog sniff as long as it's safe to do so. I'd also get an Omega Paw Treat Ball and I would like to have some time of the day where Kiki comes and spends time in mom's office. Now there's a rabbit in there, so I suggest we relocate the rabbit or even just temporarily during that period of time where Kiki can come in there. Uh, maybe after do, do some dog Stairmaster, she comes in there once she's calmed down, mom gives her a kneecap from Wolf and Whiskers or a bully stick or the uh, Omega Paw treat ball full of treats. And so that gives the dog, so we burn the dog's energy. Now the dog has an act, after it recovers, it has a little bit of activity to kind of keep you preoccupied. Probably tired at this point, gonna lay down and go to sleep. Now the dog can practice being a part of both other dogs. Now it gives both other dogs the ability to probably sleep and relax on their own. But it's really important for Kiki to practice being alone from the other dog. She doesn't have the ability to do that. So it'll be great practice to hang out with mom in the office because there at least is a human presence there. Um, all right, so um, let me see. We also talked about scent games, Google scent games. There's a whole bunch of different versions of it out there, and that is a great activity for the other two dogs because it's low impact. So great for three-legged dogs and for older dogs that have arthritis. Um, and Google, there's a whole bunch of different things out there. There's also treat dispensing toys. Try to get a variety of them. Uh, the more of those that you get, kind of makes it easier for the dog to kind of, you know, after a while we get bored with video games. Not little L girl, she likes the same game. She's been playing it for a long time. But uh, having a variety of toys and stuff will help. I didn't ask, um, but uh, well, really the resource guarding exercise that I did here with the, uh, with the food, you can also do that with toys. So if Kiki is guarding of her toys, we might want to do the same thing with Murdoch and, and uh, well, probably more with, uh, uh, I'm gonna keep on saying Aurora. Uh, anyways, um, so basically, uh, we also talked about the importance of rules. Um, rules, we th tend to think of as a negative, but for dogs, they go through life probing to see where the boundary limit is and who the leaders are. The leaders are typically the ones who enforce the rules. So if you're not enforcing rules, the dog doesn't see you acting like a leader, then listening to you is optional. So uh, some of the rules we talked about, not being allowed on the couch, you can order those X mats and put those down there, um, especially because two of the dogs don't get on the couch and only uh, one of them does, it can create a little bit of an imbalance. I would get a dog bed in each room and the dog bed should be light cream, white or light cream, no pattern on them, just color only. That way you can throw the treats on there, they see them and lure them to go there. Remember the order that you wanna do is, so if I'm gonna lure the dog into a sit, so this is the dog's head, I'm gonna lure it and this is the butt. So as soon as I get the butt on the ground, then I'm gonna say, right before the butt hits the ground, I would say, sit, butt hits the ground, and then I would give the dog the treat after. So the, uh, we wanna hear the command word if the dog knows it. So if we know the dog's about to sit, we say sit right before, and the dog's in the process before the butt hits the ground. So sit, the dog actually sits, then it gets a treat. And try to avoid saying good dog or good boy or good girl. Um, I really, uh, usually, uh, what I'm trying to get people to do now is use a yes marker. So anytime you wanna say, uh, say good dog, say yes. Yes is a good way of marking and saying, yes, that's what I wanted. So if we say good dog, because the guardian that said good dog when she was worried that Kiki might be resource guarding, uh, when she was a little bit nervous about the, uh, the, the harness that we were trying to work on. So I hear the word a good dog in a good way, and I also heard in a bad way. So it kind of muddles the water. So yes means you did what I wanted. So you tell the dog to sit. As soon as the butt hits the ground, you say yes, then you pet it. So eventually yes becomes not quite a treat, but kind of in that family. Um, all right, so we have talked about other rules. Um, not being allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food. Um, not built around uh, uh, the uh, anybody, any human that has food. And when the dogs are eating, one dog at a time, and don't let the other dogs in there. Um, and so that way, and I would feed, uh, 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 Mur I'm gonna say Mur Murdoch uh, first, and then uh, Sable, and then we would feed Kiki last. And one dog at a time. So each dog it kind of gets fed on seniority. The other two dogs have to wait behind a boundary, and then they're only allowed to come in and eat their food when they get permission. And I would use that passive training to assign a different command word for each dog. So right about before I take a first bite of food, I'm going to hear the word pork chop every day for four months. And after a while, the Kiki's like, pork chop means I get to go eat. The other dogs hear pork chop, there's no food in their mouth, so it doesn't mean the same thing to them. There's a way you can, it's important to have a different unique command word for certain actions like release from stay, uh, eating food, so otherwise all three dogs are gonna eat food at the same time if you use the same command word. Try to use funny command words whenever possible and be careful how you pronounce them. Sit and sit are two completely different words for dogs. So just however you wanna say it is fine, just be consistent. 
Um, we also talked about uh, premax. Premax means that a less desirable behavior earns me a more desirable behavior. So for example, I go to the door, tell the dog to sit one time. If it sits within two seconds, I open the door as a reward and the dog gets to go outside. So sitting, less desirable behavior, earns me freedom of going outside, a more desirable behavior. Um, if the dog does not sit, sit at your table right there and pull out a magazine, read it for one minute. After one minute, go back and tell the dog only once. Remember, the more you say it, the less you mean it. If the dog doesn't sit this time, I walk away and sit down for two minutes. Make sure you're seated. The next time I sit down for four minutes, then for eight minutes, I keep doubling the length of time until eventually when I say sit, the dog's butt hits the ground, then I open the door and let him out. I would do with all the dogs separately. Anytime you're training the dog to do these things, it's gonna be faster and more efficient if you work with each dog individually. Teach the dog all the individual steps. Remember the secret to what I do. I make the easiest version of the activity then I break it down to individual steps or slices. We practice step one over and over and over again until the dog is behaving the way that I want for step one. Only then do I go to step two and then to step three and so on and so forth. Just realized I had something in my pocket I didn't remember. Um, all right, so the idea is uh, the dog practices step one and now it knows how to perform in step one and then first two, three, four, five. Once we do all the individual steps and we bring them all together, the easiest version, then we make it a little bit harder, a little bit harder until we get to real world and that dog is behaving the way we want. We do that with all the dogs separately, then when the, we get, bring our two best dogs together and have them practice this together at the same time, then we bring the third dog in. It seems easier if you just try to do it all at once, it will not be easier, it will take you longer and it will make you frustrated. So just practice with each dog individually. Um, all right, so uh, you do pre-max for putting the, uh, pre uh, preparing the food, putting the food bowl down, letting the dogs out of the kennel, opening the door to the house, opening the door to the car, uh, even picking the leash up. So remember, you, you tell the dog to sit and then reach for the container where the food is or the leash or whatever it is. So if I reach and the dog gets up, I stop, tell the dog to sit. If it sits, then I comply again. If it doesn't sit, I, I only ask once and I go show the dog I have something else to do. And don't be afraid for this to take several times. And the secret to doing this is to practice this at times when you're not actually needing to do it. So don't practice leashing the dog up when you're gonna go for a walk because then you get frustrated when the dog doesn't cooperate. When one of your partners gets up to go to the bathroom, pause the TV, go to the leash and practice the leash, leashing exercise without having any in, uh, inclination of taking the dog for a, for a walk. This helps, uh, it's called desensitizing and it helps the dog practice the behavior. Um, and that's one of the things I do, like if you're preparing the food, remember I said prepare, do practice that exercise at times that you're not going to feed the dog so you don't have the, all, the additional baggage. Um, we also talked about uh, petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is petting your dog for a reason. So the dog nudges you, it tells you what to do. If you pet it, you're saying, yes, you're my boss. Then the dog doesn't have to listen to you. So next time your dog nudges you, tell it to sit. If it's already sitting here, tell it to sit here or here or tell it to lie down. Don't ask it to shake. If it does sit, then pet it under his chin and pet it as much or as little as you want. If you get done and it comes in and does it again and does it again, probably saying I need some exercise. So remember, I want you to kind of think about unwanted behavior as ask yourself how long has it been since I've exercised the dog. If it's been longer than an hour, get the dog a little bit of exercise. Um, so if the, you, the dog tells you what to do now, nothing happens. But if you tell the dog what to do and it does it, it gets a reward. That makes the dog more inclined to want to do it. One other thing I forgot to go over for petting um, for uh, Murdoch, I prefer that you don't pet him on top of his head. Now, he, a proud, confident dog has his nose in the air. Um, well, really, all dogs, I recommend you don't pet him on the top of the head. Best play to pet him is preferably under the chin. You can pet him anywhere you want except for here. But if all things are equal, pet under the chin because dogs are, feel good, their nose is up in the air. So petting him here facilitates that. All right, so um, let me see. Um, uh, so if you want to, uh, even if you want to pet the dog, you still tell the dog to sit. If it doesn't sit, you show the dog, I have other things going on. I have, I'm living my best life. Playing hard to get, remember, works very, very good for dog training. That will make the dog more inclined to want to do the next time because you only asked once and if the dog didn't do what you wanted, you're on to other things, watching TV, the dog's the one missed out. We don't chastise, we don't correct, we don't punish. The best way for a dog to learn is just not get what they want. Uh, and then that, next time they'll be more motivated and want to listen to it. Um, so uh, remember to use the watchword of paycheck if someone's petting without a purpose or you suspect they are. Somebody comes in, I'm petting one of the dogs. Somebody says paycheck because they see the dog standing. I stop petting. Even if I did it right, tell the dog to sit. If it sits, I would pet on her chin and I'd say, actually, I asked the dog to sit and you, when you opened the door, he stood up and I continued petting, but that's okay because I, I do forget to pet without a purpose. So thank you for reminding me. So it's a gentle reminder. It's not a gotcha. Remember, this will increase the dog's respect for you as a leader. It'll boost his confidence. It helps you practice basic commands and it also makes your pets more valuable. Take you about two months to get in the habit of petting with a purpose, but if you do, man, it becomes really, really powerful. It's super duper easy. Um, we also talked about passive training, which is celebrating the things the dog does what we like. That's the word we like to use. So if I'm standing here, one of the dog came up to me and somebody says, celebrate, I just turn and I start petting the dog. 
I'm not going to say anything because I missed the opportunity. Remember, you want to say the command word before the dog does it. But as we're doing it, you might want to say celebrate and I see the dog, uh, celebrate means and I look at the dog, and I see the dog's walking towards me. When Kiki's one step away, I would say come. Then when she takes the next step, I'd start petting her. So come, the action, and then the reward. Reward could be petting as well as a uh, 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 treat or uh, food. So after a while, the dog would be inclined to want to come to you because coming to them means I get rewarded. Why wouldn't I come to them? And so uh, I want you to pet, uh, celebrate pet for sits, downs, comes, poop, even if the dog's going to the bathroom, even though they know how to do it, just say the command word for it. When they drink water, say agua or happy hour or merlot or whatever you want to say. Um, when they eat food, each dog should have its unique command word. So right about, he's about to eat, one of them is a meatball, the next one is sushi, the next one is lasagna, whatever it is. Come up with these fun command words that really makes it easier, uh, makes, uh, it, it brightens the mood and it, it, that'll help with a lot of uh, the, you know, you got a little tension because they're worried about the dog fights. And so coming up with this fun command words, the dogs can tell you're very relaxed, that'll help them be very relaxed. Um, let me see. We also went over, uh, off camera, we went over a CER exercise. Now it's one where I had the harness in this hand and the treats in this hand. Now one of the things the guardians were doing, they were kind of being lazy. They had the treats out here, they put the harness out, the dog looked at it, they gave the treat and the harness is still here. Only one hand can be in front when you're doing a CER. So start off with both hands behind, I show the dog the harness or the leash, it looks at it, I take it away, then I give it a treat. And I do it again, and sometimes you'll have to, so you're gonna kind of have your arms akimbo like this and be like you're running. And then eventually, you're, sometimes you'll have to switch and have the harness in this hand and the treat in this hand if they start targeting one side or the other. So the progression I go through is at first I want them to just look at it, for a second I take it away. If the dog moves away, then hold it up a little bit shorter or have the distance or whatever it is, you wanna lower the intensity. But if you do this right, and again, exercising first helps. So you show it, they look at it, it goes away, and then they get a treat. After you do that five, 10 times, whatever, it, so the dog isn't moving away, it seems pretty relaxed, then I hold it and I hold it there. A lot of times the dog will lean for it, and then I pull it away and give it a treat. So progression, at first I look at it, then I lean towards it as the next step. Eventually I touch it with my nose, and then it goes away, and then I get it. And then for the putting the harness on, we're gonna hold the harness up like this, I'm gonna hold the tr my hand uh, through the harness hole, and I'll give the dog that treat. And keep on doing that, make sure your hand is going through it. But at first you're going all the way this far, then eventually you're going this far, then this far, then this far, and then eventually the dog's putting its nose through the harness. But go in slow steps. If the dog stops going it, go and meet the dog. But the idea is to progress very, uh, go very progressively in the progression. Um, and then the other thing that we did was uh, the counter conditioning with the sounds. So the sound of the cats coming in the room also caused uh, Kiki to get upset. We did it for Velcro. So I was pretty far away. I had one person who had the crack, the freeze dried beef, beef liver treats. I made the sound of the Velcro, then the dog got a treat. Velcro, dog treat. So the sound happens first, then I get the treat afterwards. After a while, I like the sound because the sound's associated with the uh, treat. Now, at first you wanna have the lower intensity. So either the volume, uh, the speed, or the intensity is lowered. I either lower the, uh, increase the distance or turn down the volume or slow down the speed. Um, until the dog, can, my two tests, can the dog sit and take the treat? If it won't sit or won't take the treat, probably getting close to too much. And so uh, again, very slow progression and work your way up to it. So you might at first have be way over by the fence and you're opening it up and back. And then eventually a step closer, step closer. Eventually you're right next to the dog's ear, open, it, open the Velcro and the dog's like looking at whatever, can I get a treat? So make a list of all the other sounds, uh, the, uh, the cat or anything that she reacts to, uh, record it. Uh, I see people do this with UPS trucks on their phone and play it on their phone and that works great as well. So the idea is to help the dog get comfortable about whatever the stimulus is so they no longer fear it, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and again, go at the dog's pace. All right, um, now um, I'm trying to think, there's probably some other things that I forgot um, to go over. So if there's anything I forgot to go in this video, um, I have one other thing I'm gonna go over. Uh, but if anything I forgot or forgot to ask me, message me. Now, if I don't have a video for it, I have to send somebody out, we charge you for it. But a lot of times we can just uh, send a video on, we've helped some other dogs, and as long as you can absorb it, we don't charge for that. Uh, if we have to come out, we have to charge for our time. Last thing, we have a young one in the house. And so I've got a great way to get the child interested in wanting to listen when it comes to the dog. I call this a candy, uh, well, it's just, I don't have a name for it actually. I should come up with one. So what you do is get like a jar or a vessel or a glass or something like that and do an arts and crafts day with uh, the, the family. So you write her name in glue and put glitter on it and butterflies and rainbows and unicorns, all the stuff she's interested, put stickers on it. And then say, you know what I learned from David when he came by is when we pet our dog, and make sure you have a piece of candy before you do this. Um, when we pet our dog, that's how we say thank you. Would you say thank you before or after I give you this Hershey's kiss or whatever it is? And before, are you sure? No, after, that's right. 
Thank you. That's right. So from now on, when you want to pet Kiki or any of the dogs, I want you to tell them to sit or to lay down or come or do some command first. If they do it, then you would pet them to reward them for doing it. And every time you do that and come and tell me, I'm going to take an M&M &M and I'm going to put it in your jar. And then at the end of the day, you get all those M&Ms as a dessert after dinner, or if you don't have sugar that late at night, maybe they get those M&Ms the next day or whatever the case may be. Now, what if, uh, or what if Kiki is doing something and, and your little one goes over and tries to want to play with Kiki while she's playing with a neighbor dog or something like that? Oh, I have to take away an M&M for that. Would you like to earn this M&M back? Yes, yeah, sit. Uh, there you go, you put it back. So you don't actually have to take it away. It's really a merit system. I would also set it up a dog bed or an area where the dogs can go to, and if the dog is there, the child is not allowed to interact. I didn't see anything that was concerning, but I've had a number of clients where I didn't see anything that was concerning during the session, but the dog was ended later on overly tired, and the child didn't read that and just kept on playing, and the dog nipped the child, and the dog is now labeled as an aggressive dog. So if the dog, they have a fight or flight response, if we can always give the dog a place to go to move away, that helps them feel empowered. If I don't like this, I go away and I'm safe over here. I don't have to nip to correct. I'm, again, I'm not seeing anything here, but this has been the case probably about three or four dozen clients where that's also been the case. The dog ended up nipping the child because the child was trying to engage when the dog was overly aroused or other similar situation. And for resource guarding, that's definitely a dangerous situation. She's resource guarding, a uh, dog will bite usually anybody. Uh, now, right now the dog's directing at, at the humans, but that can change. So just, I would make sure that the dog has a uh, safe place to escape to. And I have videos, like I said, on how to teach a dog to go to the dog bed, even for uh, Aurora slash Sable. All right, well, the, my name is David, and uh, this is the Roadmap to Success for, uh, uh, I would say, Murdoch, Sable, and Kiki. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.